So we're back again, and this will be a pretty quick talk on gout and pseudogout. And gout and pseudogout have uh, one big thing in common, and that's that they both involve crystal deposition in the joint. What kind of crystal is what separates the two of them? So crystal deposition in the joint result in inflammation because crystals aren't supposed to be in the synovial fluid. That recruits white blood cells and the white blood cells result in inflammation, the uh, release of inflammatory mediators, and pain. So these are acute pain attacks. A lot of times they can wake patients up in the middle of the night. And so because they are acute pain attacks, gout comprises about one in every 500 ED visits in the U.S. per year. So a decent amount. Men are affected more than women by a ratio of approximately 3 to 1, and blacks are affected slightly more than whites. And the reason for that is because that gout is related to the metabolism of uh, xanthine oxidase. And so there are genetic differences in uh, the rate of metabolism. The average age of initial onset is between 30 and 60 years of age. So these tend to be middle-aged men that present with gout. Uh, it may be mistaken for cellulitis, and that's just because of the inflammation over the affected joint. And the inflammation over the affected joint will look pretty similar to any of the inflammatory arthritis, uh, particularly septic arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and so forth. Okay, so let's talk about gout. So this isn't pseudogout, this is real, regular old gout. So gout is the deposition of urate crystals. And of course that results in inflammation and pain. Most commonly, uh, the first time somebody gets gout, more than half of the time it's going to first occur in the big toe. And this is called podagra, P-O-D-A-G-R-A. Uh, and, and what it looks like is just a really inflamed big toe. Uh, it's red and it's uh, it, it looks like it looks like cellulitis. It can also occur in the ankle, knee, and in the joints of the hand and the wrists. It could also be polyarticular, so patients can present with uh, multiple attacks of gout in different places. As far as a history, the predisposition, as we mentioned, it tends to occur in middle-aged to older men. There's also an increased risk in patients who are overweight, patients who drink alcohol, and patients who are on diuretics. As a matter of fact, it's not uncommon for an attack of gout to happen after uh, a night of heavier drinking. So always look for that in the history and look for diuretics on the patient's, uh, on, on the patient's med list. So the symptoms are, they, they're usually presenting with excruciating monoarticular joint pain, which may be so severe that it wakes the patient up. So this is much different from osteoarthritis and from septic arthritis. This is an excruciating joint pain that comes on suddenly. And uh, it can be polyarticular, as I mentioned, but generally the first time a patient has gout, if they've never had gout before, it tends to be monoarticular, and it tends to be in that big toe. When you look at the joint, there'll be some overlying erythema and visible swelling, and because of that, a lot of times it gets confused with cellulitis. Uh, so you should know that the big toe is the most common place for gout to present, and you should also know that any time you have erythema or swelling over a joint, you cannot just jump right to cellulitis. You have to consider possible joint inflammation. Occasionally, there may be nodules in the soft tissue, but that tends to be more present in patients who've had gr chronic gout. And what that is, is it's just the deposition of uh, uric crystals in the soft tissue. And those are called TOPHI, T-O-P-H-I. Fever can be present in patients particularly who have polyarticular involvement, and that's just because there's so much inflammation going on that it's actually causing a febrile response. So anytime you see a patient that has an inflamed, fluctuating, warm joint, the best initial diagnostic step 
provided that the patient is stable, is going to be an arthrocentesis to get the synovial fluid analysis. Because really, when you look at this joint, you don't necessarily know if it's septic arthritis, if it's rheumatoid arthritis even maybe, uh, remotely, or if it's gout uh, or something else. So you really have to get that arthrocentesis to rule more severe things out. And by more severe, I mean septic arthritis, things that can actually pose a, an acute harm to the patient. Gout itself is self-limited. So you can diagnose gout, an acute gout attack clinically if the patient has had several confirmed attacks of gout in their history. If you can look back in the patient's chart and they've got diagnosed gout and they've had several attacks in the past and now they've got an episode that looks clinically like gout, you don't have to necessarily do an arthrocentesis unless there's any other reason. But the best initial step, as far as the US MLE is concerned, you, what you've got to do in any patient that's presenting with the signs of gout, meaning erythemic, warm uh, skin over a joint, is arthrocentesis for synovial fluid analysis. And what will it look like? You will get in gout, you will get uric acid crystals, and what they look like are uh, needle-shaped crystals. And they're negatively birefringent, and when you put them in the... Uh, the microscope or whatever the uh, pathologists use, when the crystal is vertical, it's red, and when it's horizontal, it turns blue. That's what they mean by birefringent. So needle-shaped, negatively birefringent. Definitely remember needle-shaped. That's what separates it from pseudogout. Okay, so what not to do when you think a patient has gout? Do not order serum uric acid levels. I promise you that will be one of the wrong answers on a USMLE question. And it's tempting because we associate gout with elevated uric acid, and it's true. Uh, most patients who have gout have high serum uric acid levels, but the present levels of a patient's uric acid, their uric acid levels at this point in time does not necessarily correspond to whether they have a gout attack at this point in time. So while the uric acid levels in a patient with chronic gout may be high, it doesn't correspond to a gout attack. And so a uric acid level is not something we use for diagnosis. We go right to arthrocentesis. What do we do for therapy? The best initial therapy is to treat the patient's pain. So any of the urico uric drugs or uh, the drugs that reduce uric acid production, while they're useful in chronic gout, they're not used for acute care. Acute pair, care in the ED, when you have a patient that's got gout and they're in pain, you treat their pain first and you're gonna give them NSAIDs. NSAIDs reduce inflammation. And you can probably see a pattern if you've seen a lot of these, uh, these uh, rheumatologic lectures that NSAIDs are sort of the go-to for, uh, for arthritis-related pain. So gout arthritis is no different. We can use indomethacin or celecoxib. I would tend to prefer the celecoxib in a patient who has uh, a history of, of ulcer disease, but either of these would be appropriate. Now, we use NSAIDs to treat the pain. What do we do to prevent further gout attacks? That is where we use the drugs that either help us reduce uric acid production or increase uric acid excretion. Now, any patient is going to benefit from reduced uric acid production. And so all patients that have gout should be started on allopurinol. Colchicine is another drug that can be used instead of allopurinol, but the problem with colchicine is that it has a very high rate of GI side effects, and that's pretty much diarrhea. And so allopurinol is a slightly better drug, in my opinion, to go to first. But on the USMLE, you will never be given allopurinol versus colchicine. Uh, because they're both effective and they're both uh, appropriate choices. But allopurinol is, in my opinion, the best drug to use because it doesn't have the GI side effects. More recently, a drug has come out called Febuxostat, and this is marketed as Euloric. You may have seen this on the commercials. And this is another drug that uh, reduces the activity of xanthine oxidase and therefore reduces the, the production of uric acid. Now, patients who have had multiple gout attacks should 
uh, get a diagnostic test called a 24-hour uric acid collection. And what that does is it measures the secretion of uric acid in that patient to see if this is maybe a patient that's not secreting enough uric acid. So there's two ways you can get a high uric acid in your blood. You might either produce too much, which would be any patient uh, that you would put on allopurinol or colchicine, that's any gout patient you put on that. Um, or they might be one of the minority of patients that don't secrete enough. And if they don't secrete enough, you can actually put them on a medication that's going to help them secrete more. And that medication is probenicid. So if their 24-hour uric acid uh, assay collection is low, it means they're an under-secretor, and you can also put them on probenicid. But probenicid is not going to work for a patient that's not an under-secretor. So that's why allopurinol or colchicine are the best first drug of choice. Probenicid is another good drug to use if the patient is an under-secretor. Okay, so how about pseudogout? So pseudogout is a deposition of calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystals or calcium oxalate or calcium hydroxyapatite crystals. And so it's similar to gout in that it's a deposition of crystals which result in the recruitment of white blood cells, inflammation, and pain, but it's not gout because it's not uric acid crystals. It's calcium crystals. So pseudogout tends to happen in a different patient population. It tends to happen in older patients who already have pre-existing joint disease. So osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and so forth. And it also tends to happen in patients who have metabolic or electrolyte disorders, particularly those that involve calcium. So hyperparathyroidism, you would have an increased calcium level. Hemochromatosis, hypophosphatemia can cause an increased calcium level, and hypomagnesemia can also cause a disturbed calcium level. So any of those four H's, hyperparathyroidism, hemochromatosis, hypophosphatemia, and hypomagnesemia, particularly though hyperparathyroidism, are going, or hyperparathyroidism are going to be conditions that can lead to pseudogout because they all lead to increased calcium in the blood. They all make the patient susceptible to developing these kinds of stones, which would then ultimately deposit in the joint. Remember that the, um, that the, the fluid, the synovial fluid in the joint is simply an ultrafiltrate of the serum. So if you have high calcium in the serum, you're going to have high calcium in the, uh, in the synovial fluid. If you have high calcium in the serum, you're also going to have high calcium in your filtrate in your kidneys. So these patients who are likely to develop pseudogout, they're also likely to develop uh, calcium crystals and, and kidney stones. So it's vice versa. Now the presentation is almost identical to gout. And really you're not going to be able to tell the difference uh, just on physical exam alone. Uh, the most common joint affected is the knee, and the wrist, ankle, and shoulder also can be affected. But it's almost impossible to tell this apart from gout just by the physical exam alone. As far as diagnosis, you're going to have a warm, red, fluctuant, inflamed joint. And so the best initial diagnostic test is the exact same when we suspect gout, and that's going to be a synovial fluid analysis via arthrocentesis. You can see here that the crystals look quite different from uh, pseudogout. Sorry, that should say pseudogout up here. I'll edit that in a bit. Um, and the, the crystals are quite different. They're rectangular, rhomboid shaped, and positively birefringent. So here you have like a rectangular crystal. Here's like a rhomboid shaped crystal. So these are quite different uh, from the crystals that you see in gout. So how do we treat pseudogout? Again, the first initial step in therapy for treating the patient is going to be NSAIDs. We treat the pain first. You should consider working the patient up for the underlying cause if that's unknown. So, for instance, if the CMP shows an elevated calcium level, you should consider getting a parathyroid hormone level. And you may put patients who have pseudogout on low-dose colchicine as a prophylaxis for future attacks until you can treat the underlying cause. Now, 
what you might get on the USMLE is an x-ray and an x-ray that shows chondrocalcinosis. So let's look at what chondrocalcinosis is as just a last thing before we finish up. So this is a normal knee x-ray and the knee is the most common place to have calcium uh, deposits, to have pseudo gout. So we're gonna look at the knee. So here's a normal knee x-ray. You've, uh, you've got your, uh, your, your two bones here and then your, uh, your synovial lining and uh, joint space. So you can see here that it's a normal looking joint space. Now, if you look closely on this one, you've got deposition of crystals. And that's just this sort of hazy uh, line here. Here's another one. Again, it's not that nice black space that we saw in the normal joint. It's lined with, with uh, these crystals here. And here's another one. So you should know what chondrocalcinosis is uh, for the exam. And uh, that's it.